of not wearing the hijab uh, um, and so that put the fear of Allah in my heart so much that uh, subhanAllah uh, it was a turning point for me and this is I think the second turning point where I thought we need to find out more. At the same time um, one of my teachers, Sheikh Mahal um, uh, he also put something on Facebook about RSC and he uh, started uh, to organize a, uh, an event in Birmingham. And mashallah, um, they've had a second event now, and basically they put all the community together under one um, umbrella. So regardless of whatever uh, uh, aqidah or belief um, uh, you were from, um, he managed to bring all the scholars together uh, under one banner, and the, that's the approach we have tried to take whereby we're trying to bring everyone together to address this very important issue. So we're really pleased that Dr. Kate has made the time and come today. 
to, to ten, as, as I said. So uh, the format of today's session is uh, Dr. Kate will do a presentation. Uh, after that, inshallah, there will be opportunity for questions and answers. We haven't invited anybody because I think the subject matter is so important that we have to give maximum time to our guest speaker. Um, also, we have some postcards there uh, for you to write questions if you're a bit shy to ask. Uh, some of you have got to leave early because you've got childcare commitments. And thank you for the sisters to making the time. Uh, subhanallah, uh, with all the responsibilities you have, sisters. So, Jazakumullah khair for coming. Um, so, there is a second event uh, next Sunday for sisters only in Urdu. So, for mums and grandmothers and everybody else who can't come today who want to understand this subject in Urdu, we will be organizing an event here, but at 1.30. So, please do ask those of uh, you who are not able to come today. So, I'm addressing the sisters here for that. So inshallah, papers and postcards. And I want to also thank my two brothers, Brother Jamil and Brother Iftihar in the back room somewhere, who've helped um, to uh, put the message out, to organize the, um, uh, the projector, help us with everything really in the background. So we've been a team of three working together, and of course our families and our husbands without whom we can't really, who are our backbone in, in, in helping us and, and uh, working together. So really, without further ado, I'm uh, going to pass it over to Dr. Kate. Um, oh, and one final thing. We have a WhatsApp group. So um, it's a, a local WhatsApp group uh, for RSC. So basically, um, information that we're getting about what's happening, the wider picture, and Dr. Kate will talk about the social engineering aspect of it. So um, that uh, WhatsApp group is for you to join so you can keep be kept informed of the bigger picture because this is not a small thing. This is a big global, global, um, uh, if I can call it an agenda, um, maybe I can't use that word, but there's something globally happening. And when we then turn to the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu and what our Rasul has told us about the end of times, that these hadiths are coming to light uh, in front of us. They're happening in our time. So there is another dimension to this um, subject matter, which is to do with related to the end of times and to the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu um, And inshallah, in one of my radio programs, I will be talking uh, about this subject matter, going back to RSC and going back to the hadith of the end of times. Inshallah, and that pro the radio program is on a Wednesday at uh, 10 uh, from 10 to 12 where I discuss prophetic medicine and divinity. So this is related to prophetic medicine because this is going to affect us spiritually. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Gates. Thank you. Thank you. Is the microphone working okay? Yeah. Um, firstly, thank you all so much for first inviting uh, me to Derby, but also for turning up on a, a Sunday morning, which I know is easier the best for Charlie, so I'll reward you. Okay, so there's a hadith there by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that the simile of one who learns in his childhood is like that of a carving on a stone. There's another similar saying that is that, that the heart of a child is like an empty plot of land, whatever is planted there will take root. And these hadiths, these sayings, that it's incredibly important, uh, particularly when we know what, what's coming, what actually is going to be trying to put into the hearts of our children. And as parents and grandparents or whatever, we need to be, we need to ensure that we are the ones that plant the seeds into our children's hearts, not, not the teachers and the schools or the governments. Um, this is really, really key, because particularly from I think, an Islamic perspective, but also a psychological perspective, we know that what children learn in those early years are really formative. Um, so my background is as a psychologist, and I, I currently work in several schools um, across London, where I work with children and psychotherapeutically, as well as staff. So I'm, I'm quite well placed to see what is happening in schools, um, but also the impact that some of this stuff is actually already having on our children from a psychological perspective. And I hope to speak to that as I go on, inshallah. Okay, so firstly, just to kind of explain um, what RSE is, um, basically in 2017, the government had decided that coming September 2020, there's two subjects that are going to become compulsory in all schools across England. And when I say all schools, we're talking state schools, private schools, faith <coughs> schools, Islamic schools, special, special educational needs schools. Every single school in England uh, in 2020 will have to teach this subject. There is no exception whatsoever. For Wales, it's 2022, and Scotland have got their own thing coming as well. Okay, so there's 
one subject that's called relationship education, and this is going to be compulsory from reception class, so when children are about four years old, all the way through to when they leave school at 16, 17. Um, the guidelines are very vague at the moment as to what uh, this will include, but we do know it's going to be relationship kind of skills, um, and I'll just detail that a bit more as, as we go on. In secondary school, there's going to be something called relationship and sex education uh, that's going to be compulsory. Although there's some limited right to kind of take your children out of the sex education component, also that's up to the head teacher's discretion at the moment. So I will kind of repeat these and hopefully clarify um, as I go on what, the, what that means. We're actually waiting for the finalised version of the guidelines from the, gov the, gov the government, which should be due probably in a couple of months or so. However, I said they're very vague and it's leaving a lot of interpretation up to schools. And the problem is that schools are actually able to interpret the guidelines as they want and they're encouraged to go above and beyond what the government is saying. What's that done is create like an open doorway to the sex ed organisations and the LGBT lobby groups to actually come into our schools with their propaganda and teach our children um, in their ideologies. Schools are also kind of free to choose the resources, the RSE or RA resources that they want. Um, the government don't say schools have to use these resources. However, the government do recommend certain resources. There might be some examples, again, of why we need to be concerned. One thing the government guidelines does say is that schools do have to consult with parents in the development of RSE in their schools. In many cases, that isn't happening. But I, at the end, I will go through your rights as parents and how you can get involved with the schools, which is incredibly important. Okay, so what's the problem and why all the concern? And I think over the last few months, kind of by the will of Allah, the Muslim community is starting to wake up to what's happening in, in schools. However, there's kind of different narratives going on and people saying, what's all the hoopla about? What's the problem? You can read the guidelines. There's nothing too bad in it. You know, everyone's just over-exaggerating. Um, however, then you've got other people that are deeply, deeply concerned. The reason why we have to be concerned about what is happening is kind of various points. First of all, actually parental rights are being eroded. Whether you like it or not, the government are taking parental rights away. By making these subjects mandatory and teaching our children to worry about the most intimate and personal matters, the government are actually doing the job of parenting for us. And it's not a question of if you don't like it, take your child out and send them to another school, because they're making this compulsory at every single school in England. So parental rights are being eroded, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the second thing, uh, like I said, the guidelines are very, very vague, and that actually opens up problems because schools are free to interpret it as they wish. Another thing within the guidelines is that it's actually encouraging schools to teach these very sensitive and personal matters regarding what the UK law says, not to what morality says. So in this country, if a 12-year-old girl or 13-year-old girl is deemed competent enough to make her own decision, she is, under UK law, allowed to get an abortion without her parents' knowledge. That's what UK law says, and that's the way they're teaching it. They're not teaching the whole morality of these things. They're teaching in a non-judgmental, neutral way, um, but that is very, very dangerous. As I said, schools are actually encouraged to be far more comprehensive in their teaching of relationship and sex education than the government is setting out. And again, that is exactly where the danger comes. As I said, schools are free to work with any external agencies and a lot of setups. It's obviously big business um, producing resources for RSE. Um, and like I said, we've got a lot of sex ed organisations out there that have been working very hard, tirelessly around the clock um, to get their RSE resources ready, to get their advice for schools ready. The LGBT organisations such as Stonewall, um, they are advising government and they are advising schools as well. And a lot of these organisations actually receive funding from government as well. Um, so we're up against the big machine uh, with what they're actually trying to push into schools. Basically, these kind of uh, this is the kind of key point I want to make, and this is it's a very nuanced subject. Like I said, RSE in itself could look like benign if you just look at the, at the, uh, the guidelines, but the lobby groups are pushing their sexual kind of ide ideological kind of sexuality education into our schools, and that, and that is the problem. <laughs> that the government have allowed this open door for these kind of this secular ideology to come into our schools and educate our children. None of it is being monitored as well. Um, the risk, if we don't do anything to try and stop this, is that our children will become sexualised and confused uh, by what they're being exposed to. 
and this will lead to psychological, physical, and spiritual harm. And I'm not just talking kind of theoretically, because I work with children. I'm already receiving kind of children that aren't being damaged by some of the resources they're being uh, exposed to. And I'm contacted by parents almost on a daily basis with kind of the stress that their children are now experiencing. Okay, so as I mentioned, I started looking into RSE um, around about 18 months ago. And I, I kind of heard what was happening in the UK, but I, I wanted to know kind of what's behind it, where, where has this come from, what's the, what's the thinking behind it, because nothing ever appears in a vacuum. So I started kind of doing some research and I kind of discovered something called Comprehensive Sexuality Education, which is, it's, it's an international kind of curriculum uh, that's being developed uh, and it's currently being actually promoted or pushed by the United Nations. And there's something called the Global Education Agenda 2030. The idea is that they want this curriculum every school in the world by 2030, so we're talking within the next 10 years. It's deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, the, the, the resources are absolutely horrific, as is a lot of the thinking behind it. But basically it's kind of a human rights, inverted commas, um, kind of approach. And they're, assert they're basically asserting that sexual rights are human rights, and therefore children have the right to be sexual. A lot of it is built on the thinking of a biologist by somebody by the name of Alfred Kinsey. Um, he's basically seen as the master architect of sexuality education in the world. He's a deeply troubled individual. And basically, his research, which is very well documented, um, he got paedophiles to rape young children from the age of about five months and upwards. And he actually recorded their screams and their convulsions as indications that they were receiving sexual pleasure. His, his research has since been disproved, however, the damage has been done. He published something called the Kinsey Report, which is two uh, volumes um, that basically promotes homosexual acts, pornography, paedophilia, all these things. But he was incredibly influential. He was funded by the likes of Rockefeller and um, all the usual names. But it is his thinking that underlies a lot of his comprehensive sexuality education. <coughs> There's also another main organisation that I want you to be aware of called uh, IPPF, which is International Planned Parenthood Foundation. Now, they are the main NGO behind comprehensive sexuality education in the world. And they're producing a lot of resources, they're going into a lot of developing countries under the, the, the rubric of reproductive health, uh, reproductive health and rights, and actually kind of steeping this curriculum into schools against, without parents even knowing. Again, they were... Alfred Kinsey's thought is, is definitely kind of behind a lot of their, their thinking as well. They're actually the largest abortion clinic, uh, or, sorry, abortion organisation in the world. Um, and they were set up by somebody called Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenicist, um, which is basically racial hygiene. Um, so there's a depopulation kind of movement going on as well. So they are one of the biggest uh, organisations behind this comprehensive sexuality education. They've also been linked to child sex trafficking and selling aborted uh, fetal parts. Um, this is well documented actually in the media and the news. But just hold on to that name, IPPF, because I will return to it later. Now this, these international curriculum, you can Google this and, and stuff will come up, um, has been reviewed by a lot of international researchers and child experts. And there is actually a very good uh, documentary on YouTube called The War on Children. So if you Google <coughs> YouTube, The War on Children, Comprehensive Sexuality Education, uh, the documentary will come up. So basically these experts have said, um, they've done a review of it, and they've said that these curriculums, they use very graphic imagery, and it actually promotes sexual pleasure, promiscuity, and it sexualizes our children in the name of sex education. It obviously talks about abstinence, but not in the terms of chastity or waiting for marriage, but more in the terms of safer sex options, what can you do that means you won't get pregnant. This curriculum also deconstructs and redefines family norms, and it also teaches and promotes sexual and gender ideologies. Another key theme is that it undermines parental authority and the parent-child relationship. So these are the themes that these experts have identified across this comprehensive sexuality education. So when I discovered all this, I kind of came back to here in the UK and started looking at some of the RSC resources that have been produced um, and what the government was also promoting. So I started with the other similarities between the CSE, this Comprehensive Sexuality Education, 
an RSC here in the UK, given that we know the United Nations want this program in every country worldwide within the next 10 years. So I can see immediately the same justifications are being used by the UK government for RSC as there are for this comprehensive sexuality education internationally, which is in the name of safeguarding children, keeping children safe, consent, sexual health, reducing teen pregnancies and STIs, and inclusivity. Both also argue that it's an age-appropriate content and that it's evidence-based. So exactly the same arguments and justifications. So what I then did, I had kind of three questions in my mind. Can or will relationship and sex ed be used actually as a gateway to promote sexual pleasure, promiscuity, or sexualize our children? Can or will RSE be used to redefine family norms and teach our children about different sexual and gender ideologies? And will or does RSE undermine parental authority? So I had these three things in my mind as I started looking at what's happening here in the UK. So I'm just going to show you some of the resources. So these are some, a couple of resources used uh, in primary schools. Like I said, I need to make points. Schools do not have to use these resources, and the government hasn't legislated yet that schools have to use any particular sort of resources. Schools are actually free to choose uh, what they want to use. However, these resources are being produced by these uh, expert organisations, and they are appearing in some schools. So I've done a review of some of the, the imagery that's being used, and this is the milder stuff. Some of, I mean, I, I term a lot of it cartoon pornography, because actually there's no other way to explain it than cartoon pornography. Um, there's an explicit focus on nudity. And when you understand perhaps how children learn, or because I'm looking at it from a psychological lens as well, there's what we call a desensitization process coming uh, going on. Because when you get a four-year-old exposed to nude images of their private parts, again and again and again, and given that children are in school for 12 years, um, by the time they're 10, 11, this sort of nudity is going to mean nothing to them because they're so used to it that you know it's going to up the ante. So that's just one thing, this desensitization to shame, which we as Muslims obviously know is so, so important. So we have the haya, we have the modesty. They are actually eroding children off modesty in the name of safeguarding children. So the image on the left is uh, there's an incessant focus on uh, teaching children about sexual abuse. And obviously this does go on in society and it's a horrendous crime and children do have to be safeguarded. But firstly we have to ask who has the right to teach our children the names of the private parts, the parent and the state. And the government have decided that it's the state's duty and right to do that, not the parent. Um, there's also, do young children really know to, need to know the explicit names of their private parts? And actually the research says they don't, knowing the P word or the B word doesn't stop sexual abuse. Um, and actually research says actually parents are the best people to teach it. But they're, they're peddling these, these narratives that children have to know the names, they have to be as happy to say the P word or the B word as they are saying hand or head or foot. The only thing is, the private parts aren't like a hand or a head or a foot. They're very, very different. And so this is kind of normalizing, normalizing desensitization going on. Um, I mean, and just showing imagery is probably one of the milder forms. Uh, I've seen lesson plans for getting children to make uh, genitalia out of Play-Doh. Um, I had worked with a child who was sexually abused, and she was distressed because she told me that she was made to sing and chant the names of the private parts. This has actually re-traumatized her. And whoever's producing this stuff has taken no consideration of any of these factors. The way children learn, the fact children are, have some children have been sexually abused and they're being re-traumatized by this stuff, has not been given any consideration at all. Um, so it's deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, there's been hardly any consultation or thought given to this. Now the image on the right is uh, teaching children again, under the, the argument of safeguarding, is to teach children, so this is for reception class, year one, so you're talking four to six year olds, about the harms of pornography. Um, the government hasn't necessarily stipulated that pornography has to be taught to primary schools, but the sex ed organisations are really going for it. They say young children have to know about the harms of pornography. It is a societal scourge, and we do have to deal with it, but there are ways and means to do it appropriately. So the organisation that has produced uh, this, this graphic on the right, and I've, I've actually placed the blue squares so there just for hijab purposes. In their wisdom, you teach children about the harms of pornography by showing them pornography. 
this is exactly what they're doing. Um, the image is actually of a full frontal nude, uh, full frontal nude picture of a woman and a naked man. Um, it is quite grotesque and quite shocking. And the advice for teachers to give to our five-year-olds is: if you see a, an adult watching a picture like this, that's okay. If you see an older child watching pictures like this, that's okay. But if you five-year-olds see a picture like this, then please tell a grown-up. So not only have they said it's wrong, it's wrong um, they've actually endorsed <coughs> older children might watch pictures like that. But more importantly, they haven't taken any consideration of the way children learn, um, which is, is if they see an image, they're not even going to hear what the teacher's saying, because they're going to be shocked or embarrassed or think it's funny to see a nude, naked, nude woman. It takes three-tenths of a second for a pornographic image to imprint on the brain permanently. So that image is now on that child's mind permanently for life. And the way children learn is that they want to kind of mimic what they see. It's a process of something called mirror neurons. So the chances are that child will go home, will Google naked bodies, will want to see the naked body of their sister or their sibling, or will want to start acting out things in the playground. Um, it's deeply, deeply disturbing. And again, none of this is being considered. Um, children are just curious by nature. They want to learn more and do things. Um, and if they've got access to, to YouTube or whatever, or an older sibling's tablet, the chances are this is just going to perpetuate. So rather than actually protecting children from the harms, my argument is that actually this is going to exacerbate the very problem that they are seeking to, to, to stop. Okay, so moving on to secondary school, at least I hope this is secondary school. <coughs> now, the government in the draft guidelines have given a list of recommended resources. Um, one of the top resources they recommend is uh, something is a website for teenagers called Sexwise. They've described it as an excellent resource. Um, it is actually the most horrendous resource going. It, if you go on it, it's, again, it's actually promoting sexual acts in a fun, recreational, exploratory way. Um, there is a the whole thing on abortion. Do you have to tell your parents? No. Can you can you get an abortion on your own sixteen? Yes. It's it's this whole thing of sex education in this RSC is basically do what you want as long as there's consent and as long as you don't get pregnant. That is the strong message that is coming across to our children. Do what you want, have fun, just just as long as the other person consents, it's okay, and as long as you don't get pregnant, it's okay. Um, they list this whole kind of range of different acts that young people can engage with. Um, there's so many resources out there that are just, again, deeply disturbing and deeply shocking. Not only do they promote all these, these acts, they actually don't tell children about the harms of them. There are certain sexual acts that people, that they're recommending, that we know there are associated risks. We know there's far more <coughs> chance of um, spreading STIs. So again, they're promoting things for our young children to do. This is taking the whole faith and morality you know, to one side. They're actually promoting harmful um, acts for our children to do, and which is going to likely increase the risk of the very things, again, that they're, they're trying to stop, such as the spread of sexually transmitted diseases. Again, they haven't considered um, teen development, the emotional maturity of children, even if they, in their mind, think children can engage in sexual acts. They haven't considered a lot of teenagers are not emotionally ready for such um, relationships. And it's almost by you know putting a child in a sweet shop and saying, don't touch the sweets or don't eat the sweets. You know, you've got hormonal young people that are struggling with peer pressure, struggling with hormones and all the various impulses that they're dealing with, and then they're dangling all these supposedly fun acts in front of their faces. Um, again, they're, they're not taking any consideration of all of those things. Now, if you remember, I mentioned IPPF um, a few slides back. Uh, that's the organisation driving comprehensive sexuality education. That's the organisation that's the largest produced by something called Family Planning Association, FPA. FPA is the UK foothold of IPPF. So this is produced by that organisation that I mentioned. And our government is recommending that our children use this website in schools. Not only is sexual uh, relationships illegal in this country under 16 years of age, why then is our government promoting this? Um, it, there's a lot of paradoxes going on. Now, on that website, SexWise, I'm really sorry, I try and keep the language as, as modest as possible, but it is really important that you know what is going on. Um, on that website, they have a blog, and one of the, the, the uh, articles is something called create a sex list, and they refer to it as the kinky list. 
It's basically telling our children um, they should create a list of all various different safer sex acts um, and then share it with their chosen sex body. Basically, it's four pages of BDSM, which is Bondage, Dominance, Sex and Masochism acts that, you know, I didn't, luckily I don't even know what any of them are, but it, it's just horrendous and involves kind of torture and extreme acts that just shouldn't even be on a website, let alone promoted by the government to our children. But the, the writing there on the left, and I, I apologies if this offends anybody, but you do need to know what our government is recommending our children learn. And it says, finally you get to share your research. Maybe you read a really hot bit of erotica while looking up dominance and submission. Maybe you saw some awesome strap-on porn, or just found some cool looking sex toys you'd like to use. Remember, sharing is caring. And showing a partner that you looked into the stuff they liked or taped as a yes and one hell of a turn on. This is on a government recommended website for RSE resources in our secondary schools. The resource on the right is on the TES website. That's the, the main teacher's website and it's, it's by a company called Bish um, who have been recommended uh, by the TES website. Now they've developed a game for top trumps. And this is the way they do it. They're presenting these, these aspects, these subjects to our teenagers in very inverted commas, fun and recreational ways. So top trumps, I don't know if you, any of you know that. It's you used to get involved with cars. You know, my car goes 100 miles an hour, mine goes 50 miles an hour. Okay, so I'm in your car. It, it's a game like that. They have created a game of top trumps for safer sex acts. Um, so exactly the same thing. This is how they are going to be teaching this in vertical sex education in our schools. Again, holding in mind that in this country, 16 is the age of consent, and anything actually under that age is illegal. This, this company clearly explains, um, they've got some called sex explained, and it's aimed at young people who are having or thinking about having sex. There's plenty of useful information for adults. But they've clearly said they're aiming these resources at our young children. Why are they doing that when it's clearly illegal? <coughs> The irony is, in the RSE guidelines, the government keeps saying it has to be age appropriate, it has to be age appropriate. Who is defining what age appropriate is? <coughs> um, that fish training, I actually tried to get on their website um, to see what their resources were like. My internet provider blocked me. Um, it said adult restrictions, uh, content not suitable for under 18s. So again, this is an RSE resource provider being promoted on the TES website that my internet provider is saying isn't suitable for under 18s. Yeah, it's been promoted for our 14, 15 year olds. And there's a URL there as well, so you can see I'm not making up an adult warning. Um, the whole thing of age appropriateness is a big thing to be discussed, because actually in any academic year, how can you say all children at the same level of maturity? Not only you could have sort of a six year old and seven year old, a whole academic year between kind of children, girls and more children and boys, or you have children that come from more modest, probably faith-practicing homes that aren't exposed to nudity. You get some children that come from non muslim homes where actually nudity is a norm. The parents walk around naked. That does happen a lot. So, you know, some resources are going to be very unsuitable for some children, um, and maybe a suitable age-appropriate for others. So who is deciding what is age-appropriate here? Um, and I had actually, on the train up yesterday, uh, somebody was telling me that their, their daughter, in the, they had a training by Stonewall on anti-bullying, um, but they basically told the young people that it was okay to send photographs of their private body parts to their boyfriends or girlfriends. Yeah. Now, what is going on? The government is saying we've got to stop pornography, we've got to stop sex sexting, but these organisations are going into our schools and actually promoting the very thing. The government is recommending them as well, that they're claiming to stop. Um, so something very dark and sinister is going on or is being allowed to happen. Okay, so those are just a couple of examples. And believe me, there is a lot of resources that are being produced by these sex ed organisations uh, for teaching our children in primary and secondary. And like I said, does this, will this stuff sexualise our children? Um, you, can, you can ask that for yourself. But that's just a couple of examples. Okay, so the next thing that we know this international uh, United Nations back to gender is trying to do is to redefine family norms um, and to teach and promote sexual and gender ideologies in our schools to children's young people. 
And this will come into relationship education, which is a bar you have no right to take your children out of. Um, that's just a photo someone of the parents sent me. Um, it's a notice board in their primary school, and it, the blue thing says, as long as there is love, what else do you need? Um, I think they had common sense to that to start with. But basically, it's got um, grandfather, bisexual, family, Irish, Somali, lesbian, straight, trans, gender, Buddhist. So what they're trying to do is kind of play the fiddle of the Equality Act and put all these different protected characteristics up there. But actually, why would you want to know if somebody in the family is a lesbian or whatever? It's why are they kind of putting it up there and actually normalising it and equating it with the like of a cousin or your nationality? It's all to do with this identity politics that's going on that's coming into our schools. Now, the government have clearly said in the draft guidelines that LGBT issues will be taught, um, and they will be taught from reception class and upwards, so from children from the age of four and upwards. Um, and I just always have to say this, that we're not, you know, nobody condones um, discrimination or bullying in any, any form at all. Everybody deserves to live, live their life peacefully and have their human rights adhered to. We're not talking about that, and I'm actually not talking about people that actually just want to get on with their lives. Um, what they do in private is between them and God. We are the ones to judge that. However, what is happening is this movement by the LGBT lobby groups that are pushing, trampling everybody else's rights by kind of literally pushing their agenda into schools onto our four-year-olds. Um, so the Equality Act, or the Inequality Act, which is what it really should be called, um, has nine protected characteristics such as age, disability, it also has sexual orientation, gender reassignment, and religion, funnily enough. And the idea is that none of these characteristics can be discriminated against. Now, the LGBT lobby groups are claiming that uh, LGBT children are bullied, and that they're bullied far more than everybody else. Therefore, we have to teach this stuff to our children in schools from a young age. Um, this is their Trojan horse, uh, anti-bullying, because actually, they have all their own spurious research saying that LGBT children are bullied. But actually there's been a piece of research that's been quite neutral, something called the Teacher's Voice Survey, uh, which didn't have any agenda behind it. And it found that actually they asked teachers if they've witnessed any LGBT bullying in schools. And basically only 0-2% of teachers said they had sometimes seen uh, LGBT bullying. The research shows the majority of bullying just com comes down to difference. And that could be social economical class, it could be race, it could be being overweight, any form of difference. That is what bullying is about, actually not being LGBT. However, it's a very successful argument and it's actually got them very far. Um, like I said, it's got them into schools now. Um, however, they're not. They, they get themselves into kind of schools under this kind of rhetoric of anti-bullying. But actually the likes of Stonewall and other LGBT organisations are very clear what their agenda is, and it's not to stamp out uh, bullying. Um, it's that to, actually to smash heteronormativity. Um, now heteronormativity uh, for the uninitiated is the assumption that the majority of people are heterosexual. They, they want to smash that. Um, that's a quote from this book as well which is how to transform your school into an LGBT-friendly place. It's a practical guide for nursery, primary and secondary teachers. And they, they give lots of, kind of helpful advice for schools, such as smashing heteronormativity, and ideas such as getting all the parents in a school to sign up um, to an LGBT-friendly uh, policy, and if the parents don't sign, they're banned them from the school playground. Um, so this is their friendly approach to uh, rolling out their agenda in schools. Now the government, I said, in the guidelines, I said LGBT has to be taught. Um, it's made it very clear. What it has done is actually strongly recommended schools make LGBT issues integral throughout the whole curriculum. What that means is that it's not just going to be taught in discrete lessons. They're going to weave it into maths lessons. Mr. and Mr. Smith are going on honeymoon. They've got uh, 500 pounds and they need to get a thousand. How much do they have to save up? English lessons. Um, some of you may have seen on the BBC at a primary school um, got six-year-old children to write a gay love letter. They, re they read them a story about two gay princes and got them to identify as a gay prince and write a love letter to a gay prince. Um, every single subject in the curriculum they want to weave LGBT issues into it. 
And we already know that Pearson, who's one of the main educational providers, has teamed up with Stonewall, and they have committed to making all their school resources LGBT friendly. And together they've actually come up with a manual for secondary schools on how each subject within the national curricula can introduce LGBT uh, themes and issues. So this is going far beyond the Equality Act. It's like us saying, actually, we want all the girls in our school, in the school to wear hijabs. You know, there would be a mass outcry if we actually imposed our views in the same way that this, uh, the LGBT community, uh, lobby groups are as well. Um, and the thing is, with the national curriculum subjects, you have no right to take the children out of it. And this is what I mean. This is this kind of this encroachment on actually everybody else's rights at the expense of uh, well, our expense, really. Um, so these are just some of the posters. Um, again, the government strongly recommends Stonewall. Uh, we know there was a, a Prime Minister's Question Time and uh, somebody called Nick Gibb, who's one of the MPs, has, has said that they will be working strongly with Stonewall. And we know the likes of these lobby groups have been advising Parliament, um, particularly in regards to RSE and other issues. So these are some of the posters. They've been around for a while, but they often adorn uh, primary schools. And it's basically, this is how it's going to be taught particularly to young children, that in the names of diverse families. Um, so you've got mum and dad, you've got auntie and uncle, you've got mum and mum equals love, dad and dad's boyfriend equals love, mum and mum's girlfriend equals love, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what it's doing is normalising same-sex relationships as being equal to heterosexual relationships. And when you look at the fine print, not only in what the government have written in RSE, but also in what Ofsted is pushing for, um, it's not just about difference and diversity and getting children to be accepting of difference and diversity. It's an implicit um, assumption that they want children to not just respect gay people, but to respect the relationship and the act. And that is a subtle difference. Um, we can respect people, we don't have to like their behaviour, we can still respect people. But it's more than that, they are wanting our children to actually accept same-sex relationships and the act as being equal and as valid the heterosexual relationship. Um, despite, again, the research, the evidence is overwhelming that children fare best with a mother and a father. And there is a lot of research that children who grew up um, with same-sex parents actually do far, far worse on various social kind of indications. And the thing is, when children are seeing, it doesn't even, like I say, have to be, in, the, the issue is actually beyond RSE. They can just see these posters day in, day out, and it's slowly planting those seeds in a child's mind that this is normal. Okay, so back to Stonewall again, they've obviously got loads of resources and they've recommended loads of books. So these are just three storybooks for very young children. And actually we know that the NUT, the National Union of Teachers, are wanting LGBT issues to be taught um, in nursery schools, so to children as young as two. Um, and they've recommended various books. And these books, I, I am aware, are in a lot of schools already. And one teacher said they're actually giving these books away free of charge um, to schools as well. But like I want to show you how uh, the social engineering process works, uh, partly. So you start with a very young child who kind of, children love animals, young children naturally gravitate towards animals. So there's a storybook, and I'll put them at the front so you can look in the break. It's about two peng homosexual penguins, um, and it mentions that they're both male penguins that fall in love. They're not quite like the other penguins, but uh, they fall in love and they adopt an egg. Um, and it's based on a true story as well, just to give it that extra touch. So you just read a child that story and it's already planted the seed that actually two male penguins can fall in love. Children naturally move on to fairy tales um, and then we have the likes of King and King. Now this is a story about a prince. Uh, he didn't like any of the princesses his mother brought forward. Um, however, he suddenly took a shine to the brother of one of the princesses um, and they fell in love. The queen uh, wasn't too up for it at first, but she then came round and she shed a tear at the wedding. And there's also a sequel to this where they go away on a honeymoon together and adopt a child. So, you know, another seed planted. And then as children get older, they're, they're obviously more able to interact with concrete things. So then we have Heather Has Two Mummies, uh, just about nice colourful pictures about little girl who happens to have two mothers. Um, and there's a whole range of storybooks like that that is slowly starting to shape and form our children's beliefs. And remember what I said about you know planting the seeds in the heart of the child. You know they will take root. So if we're not very active as parents and make sure that we plant our seeds first, 
these are the seeds that are going to be planted. And this is exactly how you change your mindset. Um, it could be done over a couple of months, weeks, years. This is how you form beliefs and you actually change your whole kind of culture. So obviously the T part of LGBT stands for the transgender movement. And this is actually a highly aggressive movement. Uh, it, it makes the, 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 the homosexual movement and the parent in cis movements. And there's actually a lot of interfighting between them as well. So the, the homosexual lot are very angry that the T, the trans lot, jumped on the bandwagon. They actually don't want anything to do with them. Um, and I, was, I was at school and there was a, a boy who loved to dress up as fairies and stuff. And I remember the a gay teacher came to me and she said, look, I know I disagree with you on lots of things, but please can you support me with this, this trans law because leave the boy alone, let him grow up and be gay. Um, and then the trans kind of teachers say, just leave him alone, let him grow up and become transgender. And then I said, for God's sake, leave him alone and just let him grow up and be, you know, straight or normal. But it's all this kind of interfighting of what people think is best for their child. But basically, it's based on a very emotional argument that you are what you feel you are. So even if you're biologically a boy um, or whatever, if you feel like a girl, actually it's your right to be a girl. And this isn't just in schools, this is happening actually throughout the whole society. They've uh, infiltrated every area of the establishment. Um, there's been a consultation that's gone through recently. We know the likes of the girl guides have got a self-identification policy. So uh, a boy can say he's a girl and he is now allowed to sleep in the girl's dormitories. He is now allowed to use the girl's showers and the parents of the other girls aren't to be told because the confidentiality of that trans child actually trumps everything else. And this is happening a lot in schools. And I know in some schools they've already started to do gender neutral uniforms. Uh, this, this is already coming in. Some schools have got gender neutral kind of loos and bathrooms as well. The way they're going to start teaching this to our, our young children is they slip it in initially with gender stereotypes. Um, nothing wrong with that. And we, you know, we know boys can be cooks and girls can be scientists. We're not against that. But that is how they start, just to get children to question what their gender may be. And the same kind of thing with the storybooks. And this is actually, I was watching something about a young boy, probably five or six, and he was read the three storybooks I'm just going to show you over the course of the year. And at the end of the year, he wanted to transgender, and the school had a coming out party for him. And I just want to show you the very subtle ways they do it. So this is um, this is a story of a red crayon that thinks it's blue. So it just talks about the crayon's distress of being red when it really feels it's blue. And by the end of the story, all the other crayons accept it's the blue crayon that it is. So again, the seed planted there. What you feel actually is more important than what you are, or what kind of science, um, common sense, biology says you are. He was then read uh, this story, which is called Introducing Teddy. Um, it's a teddy called Thomas, who just wants to be himself. Um, and by the end of the bow tie that Thomas and Teddy wear, jumps to the top of his head and becomes a bow tie, and Thomas becomes Tilly the Teddy. That's happy because he always wanted to be uh, the person that he, she felt he was, she was. Um, they then read this story, I'm Jazz. Now this is on YouTube, it is actually a true uh, story. It's a boy that I uh, self-identified as a girl when he was young. Um, he's now a she and has gone through the whole procedure of the hormone blockers as well as the surgery. Uh, but basically the argument is I'm a girl's brain and a boy's body. Um, so there's some indication there that something has gone wrong, there's been a malfunction, that, you know, I always think the jinn up in, in heaven have kind of been messing around with the wrong brains and the wrong bodies. Because actually we're undergoing a massive surge in young people wanting to transgender at the moment. Um, there's a school down in Brighton and they had 17 children <coughs> wanting to transgender and the teacher actually whistled blue because she said all these children, or the majority of these children are autistic. There's also research showing that actually there's something called social contagion process going on, that a lot of these young children want to be transgender, have actually got friends that are transgendering. So there's not that you've got the wrong brain in the wrong body. Um, there is something with social factors going on here as well. However, what is happening by teaching the whole thing of gender identity to our children is actually potentially on so many levels, so harmful and so damaging because young children firstly can't understand the concept of gender constancy until they're seven. So by telling them that they're a boy when they're a girl is confusing them, especially when they're getting a message at home or if you're, you know, if you're my daughter or my son, and then they're going to school and getting an opposite message from the teacher. Um, 
teenagers themselves, we know they're kind of going through this kind of identity formation process as well. So it's just actually pushing and colluding with children in actually many cases where they need psychological support. I'm not talking about the minority of cases that have the intersex condition where they are born with both genitalia or those uh, who've been diagnosed with some mental illness called gender dysphoria. Uh, these are psychological conditions that generally do need support and understanding. But there is like this, this trend, this fashion going on where because you can be what you feel you are, therefore that go, go for it basically. What is happening, and I, I was talking to colleagues as well, that particularly in teen, the teen years, there is, children are almost picking up an LGBT identity as a means of getting acceptance with their peers. Um, and this has been observations of, kind of non-Muslim colleagues that I work with as well. It's kind of in the old days, you used to be a hippie or a goth or, or whatever. Now it's almost the fashion to be a lesbian or a gay or a transgender. <coughs> The danger is that this is often masking actually a deeper distress that the young person is facing. So whether it's low self-confidence, um, self-esteem, whether they can't get friends or, or whatever in other ways, they're almost latching onto these identities to get acceptance within their peer groups. Um, and there's a lot of confusion going on in, in the mix of it as well. So this again is a post and all aimed at primary children, it's called the gender bright person and it's just again teaching children that actually your, your gender identity, your, your biological sex, they can all be very and on the continuum. I can't even make head or sense of it, it's very, very confusing. Um, but what is happening is these, these lobby groups are actually pushing their sexual ideologies into our schools um, and actually not only reconstructing family norms by saying actually the, the mother, father, family configuration is only one of a whole kind of mixture now. And even, like I said, they're not always even teaching as equal. A parent sent me a video that her six-year-old daughter was made to watch without the parent even being aware. And it was under the name of Diverse Families. What it was, it had a tree with birds in and all the different nests had different family makeup. So you had one bird that had two pink mummies, one bird that had two blue daddies. You had the odd single bird for a single parent family. And they kept repeating this, oh, that family's got two mummies. Not once did they mention a bird's nest with a one mummy and a daddy. So there was no equality at all. It was just, again, pushing this idea that actually, as long as you have love, it really doesn't matter. You can have two mummies or two daddies. Again, not to stigmatise or discriminate against there will be children that have two mummies or two daddies, but what they're doing that behind this agenda is normalising same-sex relationships as being as equal, if not more valid, than heterosexual relationships. That is how they're redefining family norms. So our children now aren't just going to think of the normal family as being a mummy and a daddy. They will be thinking it could be two mummies, two daddies, two mummies, two daddies, whatever. This is how they are redefining um, family norms and teaching of these kind of sexual and gender ideologies, as I've mentioned, is very clearly the government have made it mandatory in our schools. Okay, so the third point, kind of looking more at um, uh, the undermining of the parent-child relationship and of the parental authority, which again is another key uh, indicator of this comprehensive sexuality education. You don't have to look too far to at least consider that the government are eroding parental rights. So there's, there's no two ways about it. Um, from September 2020, you will not be able to remove your child from relationship education, where such subjects as LGBT issues will be taught, the harms of pornography, child safeguarding. These are more likely to be taught in relationship education. Um, you don't have the right to take your children out of those lessons. The government did say initially that actually at secondary school parents could retain the right to opt their children out of sex education. But back in the summer they put their draft guidelines out and they further retracted on that. They're now saying you have the right to re request withdrawal. If you want to take your secondary school child out of sex education, you now have to get to the head teacher's permission. So you're going to have to go through a process of explaining to the head teacher why you want to withdraw your child. And that will involve the head teacher most likely saying perhaps why it would be beneficial for your child to attend those lessons. It's not necessarily going to be a straightforward process. Um, and the government, again, haven't delineated on what grounds uh, the head teacher can reject that, that right to request. But again, it's actually going to discourage many parents from even trying to attempt to get their children out of these lessons, particularly if they're intimidated by authority, 
particularly if they don't have a good command of the English language. However, you do have the right, um, unless it's exceptional circumstances, to take your child out of sex ed at secondary, um, and the automatic right to take your child out of sex ed at primary. <coughs> However, please be aware, a lot of the sex, what we would consider sex ed subjects, are being shoehorned into relationship education, and are being shoehorned into the national curriculum, which you cannot take your child out of. The government have also stipulated that three terms before a child turns 16, um, so basically when they're 15, that child will be able to uh, override parental choice. So if you don't want your 15-year-old your uh, attending sex ed classes and your child wants to attend, the government gives that right to your child to actually overrule you as a parent. In the legislation, there is also a loophole um, that actually in the future they can make sex, ed ed sex education compulsory um, without passing further legislation. So we know this is a long-term plan and we're going to have to stay very aware, very vigilant of what is happening. The last point, as I mentioned, is that a lot of these stuff is going to be shoehorned into the national curriculum and you can't take your child out. So, you know, undermining parental authority is very obvious by taking our rights away in these things. However, it also happens in much more subtle ways. Um, and this, I think even last week, a parent was saying that their five-year-old child's daughter came home from school and said, oh, my teacher said that I can marry my best friend, who's a girl. Um, this is happening. We can't pinpoint it or say the government is saying this, but we know this is happening in some schools where teachers are saying to the children that it's OK, you can you marry your friend of the same sex, or if girl, you want to be a boy, that's also OK. Again, this is undermining parental authority. And that relationship where the parent is saying one thing at home and the child is taught you know, another thing by their teacher at school. Somebody was also telling me that in their school they have something called the Rainbow Room. Um, and this is a lovely colourful room where they've got somebody from the LGBT uh, lobby group sitting in it who's all very fluffy, nice and welcoming. And that if a teacher suspects a child may be LGBT, uh, they actually tell the child to go in this room where the child you know, will be nurtured and listened to uh, without parental, no parental knowledge whatsoever. Another example, again yesterday somebody told me that their, their daughter had been on Stone, in the, their daughter's school had had an antibody training by Stonewall and uh, said to the girls, it's okay to be a lesbian, uh, you need your rights in society. And they said, if, you, if your parents don't agree with you being a lesbian, don't worry, come to us or come to phone child line and we'll support you, but just don't tell your parents that you're contacting us. So again, these are the very subtle, maybe less subtle ways that actually, not to always the government, but what the government is allowing to come into our children's schools are actually undermining, undermining um, not only parental authority, but they're driving a wedge between parent and child. And if you look back at history and how one way to cause a revolution uh, and, and destroy the family is to, to create this wedge between parent and child. And there's a lot of thinking around um, sex education in particular, that it's a very powerful means, uh, like I said, to cause a revolution. Because what you do, you enslave young people to their passions in the name of freedom. You've then got them. You drive a wedge between them and their parental authority or their religion and they then will rebel against the family and the culture. That is how you create the revolution, and this is exactly what is happening. This is exactly what I'm trying to warn people about. Even if they don't see it now, believe me, this is coming in the next 10 years. So those are some more of the explicit ways um, some of the resources are, are going to be rolled out. But I also want parents to be alerted to the more subtle ways as well. And just when you're looking at your school's resources for teaching RSE, please look out for these themes. Um, this is just one resource, it's something I think it's called the Christopher Winter Project. It seems to be quite popular with schools. Um, I haven't seen the resources, this was the only one I could find on the internet, in, internet to download. Um, but basically the themes I would urge you as parents to look out for is um, obviously the promotion of sexual pleasure and exploration, normalising as well as undermining parental or religious authority. Now, I just had a very brief look at this, this thing, which is a, problem, a puberty problem page. And you would think, at least teaching puberty, it should be fairly biological and factual. But the way they twist all these things is having a, a puberty problem page, which is probably more of interest to children. But that's where they can slip <coughs> different agendas and values and ideologies in. But I've circled a bit, and it said, basically, my family doesn't talk um, about things like sex. My nan won't let me go out. How can I tell her I need more freedom? I can't talk, talk, talk to my family about these things. 
So just very subtle, you know, planting of the seeds that you can't talk to your family, but actually you can probably talk to me, the nice teacher at school. And they've also dropped in that, that my aunties are gay and that uh, the ballet blues is about a boy who wants to be a ballet dancer. So again, just a subtle thing around the gender, the gender thing there. So I would urge parents just to keep those four kind of threads and themes in mind when you're critically looking at your, your children's RSE resources in schools, because um, you're allowed to see what the schools are using. Having done uh, these talks, there are two main questions that I, I kind of get fired at slightly. One is, yeah, but children need sex education. Um, yes, they do, and I'm not saying they don't. Um, absolutely, and Muslim children definitely need sex education as, as much as any other children. But we have to ask um, who should have the right to teach it, uh, or at least choose who has, you know, ch choose who should be teaching our children in these matters. Uh, the government have given us no right. They have taken, it's basically a totalitarian move, um, the state takeover. They have taken our rights as parents away to educate our children in the most intimate of matters, and that is what is deeply disturbing and absolutely wrong. Children do need sex education, but at least give us the right to choose um, who teaches them and when, because um, actually we know our children best, not the state and not the teachers. The main justification is uh, schools have to do this because parents aren't doing a good enough job. That, that's what they're saying, and I've seen some replies to from MPs as well about the debate that's coming up, which I'll mention. And it is that parents aren't doing a good enough, good enough job. Yet there is no evidence to suggest that parents aren't doing a good enough job. The reason why we have all these problems in society is a fallout um, of a lack of morality. It's a fallout of sexual revolution where you know everybody can do what they want, with who they want, where they want. Um, they've created this mess. They've allowed the porn industry in. That is the reason we're in the mess that we are, and all they're doing is saying, blame parents, you're not doing a good enough job. Um, it's a very, very lazy argument that they can't substantiate. Even if parents aren't doing a good enough job, so empower parents and support them, train them, educate them to actually do a better job themselves rather than take their rights away. And actually somebody sent me some research actually this morning, and it's actually another... The research actually shows sex education doesn't work. There's three very powerful studies that show SRE in this country has not worked. It hasn't reduced teen pregnancy rates or STIs. Um, the initiatives that have worked better are actually local authority when they're doing that in conjunction with parents, not in schools. And there's two big international uh, research studies that basically shows comprehensive sex education does not work. If anything, it makes the problems worse. Um, therefore, we know parents are the best ones to do this for their children. Government should be putting their money, training parents, educating parents and supporting parents, not demonising them and blaming them. And if we are just talking about sex education, as in the, the reproductive cycle, that's already taught in schools in science lessons, and actually that is sufficient for the majority of children. As I said, RSC is not biologically based sex education. It's not the sex education that you or I probably had when we were at school that are thinking of. It's very value laden. Um, it's allowing the pushing of a secular ideology regarding sex and sexuality into our schools and actually into our children's minds from the age of four years old. <laughs> So the other kind of big thing, uh, question is, well, this isn't happening in our schools. Um, and I've had this from teachers, I've had it from parents, I've had it from local councils. They say, this isn't happening in our schools. Parents can be involved in the process. They can opt your children out of sex education, blah, blah, blah. This response is completely missing the point. Um, the point is that government are recommending many of the resources that I've shown you. And regardless, they're allowing these resources into our children's schools, unmonitored and unvetted. Um, and these resources are already in many schools, um, or some of them. Uh, a lot of, like I said, a lot of worse than what I've shown you is already in our children's schools. The other point to remember, if it's not happening in your school now, then it, it's coming. Uh, like I said, the United Nations want this comprehensive sexuality education into every school worldwide by 2030. That's only 10 years away. So RSE, um, in my opinion, is our UK version of comprehensive sex education, and this is just the beginning. We know governments will change legislation. Uh, once we've all calmed down a bit, they'll say calm them down a bit, let them accept what's there, then they'll, they'll add a bit more. Uh, the analogy I use is like when you have to spoon feed a, a child, and you might 
give a toddler a bit of broccoli and it spits it out. So you maybe break off a little bit or you wrap it up in mashed potato and shove it in its mouth until it accepts it. And then you gradually increase the broccoli until it's more palatable. Before you know it, the child's eating a piece of broccoli. Um, it's the same process, and this is what is going to be happening over the, ten years, uh, the next 10 years. And this is what I'm talking about, social engineering. And already in our Muslim community, we're facing that uh, we know a lot of you know, personally, I know a lot of Muslims haven't attended the tours because they disagree strongly with what I'm saying um, for various different reasons. That it's they're already buying a lot of the narratives and, and the things that they're being told, even when it's completely against our religious teachings as well. Um, the other point is, even if it's not happening in your school, so what? It's happening in other schools. And actually, we have to be concerned about the well-being of all children, not just our own. Uh, we've got to stop being so insular. And actually think about the bigger picture here. Um, you know, if we're going to be questioned on Judgment Day individually as well as a community, what are we going to say that we did? Um, not on a personal level, but on a communal level as well. We have to think beyond ourselves and we've really got to wake up and, and resist and, and try and stop this uh, from coming into our schools. I know the problem is bigger than schools and it is in every area of society as well, but it is like the crest of the ways that they're now state enforcing this on our four year old children and our boys. So basically we have to ask ourselves, is this education, is it a, a relationship sex education, or is it actually ideological indoctrination? Because in my opinion, uh, it meets all the criteria for comprehensive sex education. Um, and basically what they're going to do is create these rootless individuals uh, that they can manipulate and control. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of psychology involved in what they're doing. Uh, there's a lot of psychologists behind the whole social engineering process. When you get a young child that is very malleable and easily manipulated because of anything that goes into their mind, particularly from a teacher who's an authority figure, they are going to accept it uncritically. Um, so unless we're on top of it as parents are aware, they are going to be forming our young people's minds, beliefs and values. And the danger is, because a lot of this is very against our religious values, that in the next generation, 10, 15 years, we're going to have a generation not only want and don't want anything to do with Islam, they could well be the enemies of Islam. And this is a real, real danger. Um, so there's, there's a, an interesting quote there by somebody called Adolf Huxley, A Brave New World, that the real revolutionary revolution is to be achieved not in the external world, but in the souls and flesh of human beings. So whilst we're all busy uh, you know, with the horrendous things going on in Palestine and Yemen and, and Syria, there's actually a war that is currently being waged in the hearts, minds, and souls of our children, and it's happening right under our noses, and it's state-imposed. Um, so this is very, very dangerous, and we, we really do have to do something about it. That is the first part, just to give you an overview of what is happening. Um, I'm not here to convince you this is happening, but I'm, I'm really here just, just to warn you and just to look out for this. Um, you can do your own research, come to your own conclusions. I'm just really presenting my research and my concerns to you. Um, the second part, we will look at what we can do, because um, it's not all doom and gloom. I think we've got to take ownership now and do what we can do. Now we know what the problem is, we can do something about it. I'm happy if there are any questions just for sort of five, ten minutes, and then maybe we can have a ten minute break, and then we can do the second part. Um, you mentioned the report that you've seen this morning. Which report? The report that you said this morning about the uh, evidence that it's not working. Uh, you can email me. There's two. Cause basically, I'm, I'm having to put a parliamentary briefing together for the debate, and I've gone through the research. I can, if you email me, I, I can give you. I've got about four studies that are showing this. This this stuff isn't working. If anything is making the problems worse. Yeah, right at the back. The sex education, the way they have a different day is to teach or is just through Monday to Friday teaching. I don't know, yeah. I think you missed the meeting. Is it just going to be on specific days? Yeah, so it's a question, is it going to be on specific days or is it going to be weaved into the whole curriculum? That your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's up to the school. Um, so the school can choose. They can do it in like a Monday afternoon, once a month, or they can weave it into all the different subject matters. The schools have got a lot of power to basically interpret it how they want at the moment. So that you're going to have to check with your school, but we'll come on kind of after the break what you can do with your school. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
after September 2020, can children still have the choice to leave the lesson if they feel uncomfortable? No. No, they have to stay. Yeah, they have to stay. Could you just say what the question was? Sorry, the question was after September 2020, if the child is feeling uncomfortable in the lesson, will the child have the right to leave the lesson? And the answer is no. The only right the child has been is when they turn 15 to attend sex education against their parents' wishes. No, parents have no rights, children have no rights. Uh, all the rights are given to the, to the school, the teachers, or the, the government. So any other questions? My question is, um, I'm a 29-year-old, and I've been born and born in England, and I've been to school in England, and to be honest, everything that you have said is already there. Um, I'm already in touch with a lot of teenagers. They're used to uh, LGBT because they've got unisex toilets. Um, my question is that there are a lot of people, a lot of Muslim leaders as well, like yourself, they will talk about sex education, and like, I've got kids, I wouldn't want my kids to go to school, but there's no one who will come forward and tell us that, okay, well, you can home educate them, and that this is the process of home education. There needs to be a generational shift now towards home education, and there's no one to lead that way, because, to be honest, even if there wasn't sex education in classes, there was so much social media sex out there that even if they didn't teach sexual, ed sexual education in classes, there's really enough of it. Like I said, I'm 29 years old. I've, I've been brought up with this, and if I was to see a person in a bikini or in their boxer shorts or whatever, I wouldn't bat an eyelid. So I'm trying to say that thank you for what you've told us. It's really good that you brought it to life. But the, what is the movement to get, because even if we took our kids out of these classes, taking them out of the classes do, do, does not take them out of that brolly. And that body is so instilled through cartoons, through social media, through friendship groups, and like you said, through every lesson now in math, science, English. So there needs to be someone who leads a generational shift now, for Muslims especially, that our young generation are not in school, they're home educated, and somebody needs to provide that support for that kind of home education. So there isn't that movement. Well, I, I, I will come on to home education after the break. But I think there are various solutions. I think home education is a solution. I don't necessarily think it is the solution. Because um, I've actually had people who've been home educated approach me who are their children turn into lesbianism as well. Like you said, these issues are everywhere in society. The point is, though, it's now being forced on our children whether we like it or not. So you, there's a lot we need to do in schools and stuff we can have some say as parents. The problem is, up until now, parents have been largely sleepwalking. My, myself included, I wasn't aware really what was going on in schools. Um, so we've now got a generation that actually think it's okay to be gay, or that they're, they're you know, having sex outside of marriage, and all these, all these different things. Um, because I think parents necessarily haven't been aware of what's going on. The difference is that this is now being forced on our children from the age of four. The, the flip side is that now at least parents we are aware of it, so we need to be much more proactive. Um, and I think whether you're in an Islamic school, a faith school, home education isn't really the issue. Is we're going to have to be much more proactive as parents in talking to our children about these issues. But I will kind of cover this in, in the second part, inshallah. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay. Back in the front. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> will RSE be compulsory uh, for home education by the virtual home? Sorry, with RSC okay. compulsory? So should, should you go down the homeschooling route, yeah? <coughs> would RSC uh, be compulsory for homeschooling by, uh, by the virtual heads? At the moment, if you homeschool it, it's, it's not compulsory. However, the other thing is they, they are going to clamp down on homeschooling families. There's already, I think, a consultation going through that they want all families to register. They're going to be monitored terminally. We've also got the issue of prevent, uh, which, which plays into all this. And if there's suddenly a massive shift of Muslim parents home educating, believe me, prevent will get, get on the case. Uh, we've got to be much more strategic. At the moment, you don't have to teach RSE if you're home educating, and it is a potential immediate solution, but I don't think it's necessarily a long term solution. Are you, um, are you sure about that? Because, I mean, schools as a whole, they're only uh, checked by a regulator every three years. So, in terms of home, you know, homeschooling, how that is actually audited and how that's checked, you know, um, are you, are you yeah. There's a consultation going through at the moment that they actually want to tighten up with homeschooling. So that's that's currently, I think there's a petition going around about trying to fight that. 
But I'm, no, I'm not against homeschooling. I homeschooled my children for a couple of years when they were younger, and I think it's an immediate thing. And I would argue, particularly for the early years, keep your children on school as long as you can, um, protect them. But it doesn't mean you, you can't avoid having these conversations with your children. I think mean, that that's the point. This stuff is everywhere. And there's no point keeping your children at home if they're then exposed to, you know, iPads, video games. They're actually doing just as much damage. So uh, I think it's a lot of things. It's not a black and white uh, solution. Uh, but it's definitely something, one of the options to consider. But I think, you know, to answer the other sister, we can't wait for somebody to start leaving this. We have to do it ourselves. And I've, I've noticed in the community, there's this waiting for something to kind of drop down from the heavens to, to lead this and solve the problems. That's not going to happen. You've got to do it yourselves. It's your child. You have to take responsibility and actually do what you can for your own child and family. Yeah. Just in the beginning, you mentioned about like this is all research evidence based, but you didn't elaborate on this. So, what is the evidence behind that teaching RSC is good for prevention? You mentioned some of the research has been discredited, and I think it was unethical. So, if there's any solid papers or any solid research being done, that RSC is a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to find some. I mean, I've got all the references at home. I don't necessarily put them into here, but I've got the four papers that have shown that there's two that have shown that SRE hasn't worked in this country, and two that have shown that comprehensive sexuality uh, also doesn't work as well. It actually but is there anything that says it does work? I mean, the, the problem with research, you've got to understand how to receive, uh, read a research paper. Yeah, there's, there's going to be loads of research saying it does work. There's going to be loads of research saying LGBT children are bullied. But what you have to do is actually critically analyze the research paper, you've got to firstly find out who's funding it, who's funding the research. You've also then got to look at actually who do they speak to to get their statistics from and actually how many people do they look at. It's very easy actually to deconstruct any research and it, there is no um, object of research really. Um, but you know a lot of the, the research that's put forward is funded by the sex ed organisations so of course it's going to be favourable. Well, that's, that's a conflict of interest so of I'm not sure is. how they build a whole curriculum for generations to come, based on something being paid for. Because it needs a lot of time, and you know, this is the problem, they have a lot of time on their hands, they can set up these research studies and getting the results that they want. And it, <coughs> evidence has shown people believe statistics, even if they think it's wrong, people believe numbers, it's a psychological game, so they put out all these statistics that people are buying. But what it actually needs is the time to actually sit down and, and actually critically look at all these research studies. Because, um, you know, even teaching, I started doing on teaching children the explicit names of the private parts. Um, and I found, I've started going through all the papers, and I say it doesn't claim what they're saying, uh, that children have to know this stuff to protect, prevent sexual abuse. It says in some cases it will give children a language to explain they've been sexually abused. It doesn't prevent it. Other studies said actually parents are the best one to teach it at an older age, about the age of eight or nine. And actually, the main study that's been quoted is actually supported by sex, it's been funded by a sex education uh, organisation as well. So you can see all the ulterior motives in these studies. But it, it just needs a lot of time to actually go into the research uh, and sort of critically evaluate it. And for more research to be conducted. The second question I know you said this is an agenda by UNESCO by 2030, and the benefit is just like to normalise everything. But in your view, is there another hidden benefit from the people promoting this? Like, is it to the depopulation, or is there anyone yeah, who's making I mean, money I, from it? Or? Yeah, I think there's various, there's a lot of different social and political movements. So depopulation is, is very much in it. Um, they're culling the world's population, and they're definitely going to the more developing countries in the world in the name of reproductive rights. There's a very strong de depopulation agenda um, to it. IPPF, like I said, it's the largest abortion organisation. It's a, it's, and I think one of the international experts said it, it's a money-making game. So basically, you give the children this stuff, they do get pregnant, or they need to buy contraception, they need counselling, they need STI treatment, they need abortions. And then, you know, you've got these organisations there to, to provide it for them. It's, it's, you know, follow the money as well. I think that's another agenda. Um, like it's a very secular ideology um, that, that's driving this. Um, it well, depends how deep you go, really. Um, and there's definitely, you know, like I said, the original research by Arthur Kinsley is, is built, big, uh, built on paedophilic you know, abuse of children. So there is, is that in there. And at some level, it does feel like a mass grooming uh, of our children as well, if you want to go really dark and deep. Um, but it, you know, it, it's tempting to destroy the nuclear family, the traditional family. Uh, it, it's, it feels like a war. Um, like I said, people can go away and do their own research into this. This is just an overview. 
Uh, in regards to all of this, my biggest thing I'm looking at is that we're focusing generally on Muslim communities as far as I'm aware. Is there any other minorities or the religions that might be taking an interest in thinking this is a concern where we can work together? So essentially, if this is just Muslims pushing this forward, again, we're promoting the prevent and the Islamophobia. So surely we should be looking at other communities who might think this is an issue. Mm-hmm. As well? Yeah, I'm in touch with a Christian uh, organisation. I'm in touch with a couple of people from the Jewish community that are also fighting this. But it's, you know, why, you know, it's, people have also got to come forward as well. It's, you know, the it's, and I'm, I'm not trying to approach this purely from a faith perspective. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to highlight the psychological distress and harm that is being caused to our children. I'm, I'm willing to kind of work with any community or do these talks for any community because I think it's not Muslim specific. Um, like I said, I, I'm in touch with one Christian organisation. The Christian ones, I've, you know, that they seem to be less active on this. Um, they've got slightly different views. The Jewish community are slightly more active on it, but again, they're fighting <coughs> something more called the independent school standards. So tw- I think 70% of Jewish children in private schools, and they they've got something with Austin that's actually trying to make them promote uh, same-sex relationships. So that they're, they're fighting that. Um, but I am in touch with them. I've got a couple of meetings coming up as well. I to see how we can kind of work together with them. Um, but I think we have to be careful that it's not only seen as a faith issue. Because uh, I think for me, this is actually a, a safeguarding or welfare of children issue that actually anybody should be concerned about, not just people with faith. Because you take a break. Take a break. Then we'll do the second part, which is going to look at things that you can do uh, and show up and take more questions at the end. You know, awful as it is, there is there is stuff that we can do. Um, and again, another quote there that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So I think whatever we can do, it doesn't matter how small or large. It's just important that we do uh, as individuals and as a community do at least something. Um, I don't have the solutions, uh, but I, I've just started to think about various things that, that may help. Um, but I, I really urge you, again, individuals and communities to come together and think about how within Derby you can kind of help each other and support each other in these in these regards. <coughs> The way I see it, and I'm not saying this is right, is a two-pronged uh, approach to resist and prepare. So basically we need to kind of resist the agenda as far as we can. It does feel that we're up against the machine, and there's no doubt about that, but it doesn't mean that we at least don't try to resist it. Um, and we know that Allah will put the help wherever he, he sees fit. So I think one thing we can do by being here today, uh, hopefully you've got a little bit more insight. Um, you can go away and do your own research. Uh, like I said, you don't have to take my word for any of this. Um, you've all got independent minds and thoughts. Um, so you know, draw your own conclusions. But I would urge you to find out more and to create awareness with your families, uh, with your friends, your communities, um, just so at least parents are more kind of tuned into what may be going on in their schools or what is, is likely to be coming over the next kind of years ahead. Um, one major thing parents can do is actually resist in schools, and I will go on uh, to speak about that in more detail. Um, the other thing is uh, to campaign, and I'll come on to contact your local MP in the next slide, uh, which kind of relates to the petition that's been set up. So that is where we can try and fight this agenda and resist it. However, long term, uh, the only really thing that we can do is, is to prepare our children. Uh, we're going to have to educate our children in, in, in these matters from an Islamic perspective, and we're going to have to educate them with critical thinking skills so that they actually have the tools and the skills to actually kind of combat these different ideologies that they're going to be exposed to. Now, I am talking, I guess, primarily about young children that are going to be coming up through the system. Uh, as a community, we do need to think about our teenagers and young adults that have been exposed to this stuff over the years and already have very different beliefs um, and behaviours to those that perhaps we would want them to have. That's another issue we have to think about. Um, with our children growing up, we do need to strengthen their Islamic identity. Um, I work with a lot of young people, and a lot of young people are turning away from Islam because they're seeing it's not relevant to the lives and experiences that they're having. <laughs> so we really need to think about how we are we going to attract uh, our, our young people to Islam um, in a way that is very relevant and current to them the issues that they're facing. Another thing uh, that I've been in touch with kind of various people about is to develop a kind of a RSE counter curriculum. Uh, I'll come on to this a bit later, but it, it could be a curriculum that perhaps we taught at home by parents or in the madrasa. 
but it's giving our own face, kind of face version of the different issues that RSE is attempting to cover. There's a real need for community issue uh, initiatives and youth work. Um, like I said, we've really got to draw in a couple of the young people now. Um, it's going to be a need for parental support. I think it's a, probably one of the hardest times to be a parent uh, in these times. We're going to have to be uh, thinking about how to support parents, whether it's through workshops or resources or whatever. And Islamic schools and home education. So I will touch on these, some of these things in a bit more detail. But these are all kind of ways that we can help kind of immunise, protect and prepare our children. Okay, so just um, a quick petition update. In, back in December, I set up a petition um, to give parents the right to opt their child out of relationship and sex education. Now, I know that in itself isn't going to solve the problem. I'm under no illusion. Um, even if they granted it, I know it's not going to solve the problem. But it was more a fundamental principle that it's very clear what the government has done is taking parental rights away. And I just wanted to kind of make a point and a stand that actually parents should have the right to at least choose if their children attend these lessons. By the will of Allah, we've managed to reach over 100,000 within around about six weeks. And it has been, I think, one of the fastest growing petitions that's currently available. Um, it is going to be debated in Parliament on the 25th of February. Um, again, that in itself won't necessarily have any legislative power. It's not necessarily going to change anything. However, it has raised the issue. It has made the government aware that a substantial amount of parents aren't happy with what they're doing. But more importantly, it's actually created a lot of awareness, and it's received a lot of support from the non-Muslim community as well. Um, I know I've had a lot of contacts from Christian people, from Jewish people, and from people without faith as well who signed it. So alhamdulillah it has created awareness. And I will be thinking again how to kind of uh, monopolise all that awareness uh, going forward as well. What people can do now if they want to support the debate is to contact their local MPs. Um, a brother in the community is, uh, defines a very natty little kind of widget thing. Uh, it's a three-click email to your local MP, and basically all you have to do is put your name and your postcode in. It automatically gener generates an email to your local MP. Uh, it's a template email, you can adapt it, personalise it as you wish, and then you just literally click send, and it will go to your local MP, telling them about your concerns and if they would be willing to uh, take part in the debate um, if they're in favour of this on the 25th of January. Um, there are links again on the website, which is uh, stoprc.com. Uh, you can still actually sign a petition up until June 2018 and uh, 2019, right? so it is still open until June. However, like I say, it's being debated in a couple of weeks' time. I don't really know what, what will happen after that, but you know, just the character of signatures is quite uh, effective in itself. Okay, so it's really important that parents do know their rights. Um, basically, the draft guidelines, like I said, we're still waiting for the finalised version to come out within the next couple of months. But it's unlikely to be remarkably, remarkably different to the guidelines that we've got now. So just to let you know as parents what your rights to withdraw your child currently are. Up until September 2020, you do have the automatic right to take your child out of SRE or RSE or whatever it's called in your school. So you can remove your children from these lessons up until 2020. However, as I said, a lot of this stuff is coming to the national curriculum or it's going to be posters and in the hallway. So you can't obviously protect your children from that or withdraw them from the, the main topic. <coughs> After the 1st of September 2020, uh, relationship education is compulsory for all children in all schools from primary school and secondary school. As I mentioned earlier, for sex <laughs> education, you do have the right to request withdrawal from your child, for your child from sex education at secondary school, but that will be down to the head teacher's discretion. Hopefully, uh, currently, this will be the same, that if sex education is taught in primary school, uh, you will have the automatic right to take your children out of sex education. Um, this is all until, obviously, a child turns 15, and then they have the right to choose themselves if they want to attend sex education, even if it's against you with the parents' wishes. So the right to have a say, it is very clear in the guidelines that the government and their schools do have to consult with parents on how they're going to develop the RSE <coughs> curriculum and the resources that are going to be used. Uh, schools won't always necessarily be proactive in inviting you to take part in the consultation, so you are going to have to get involved in yourself. But you do, as a parent, have the right to get involved in the school's RSE policy, 
um, and also to see the resources that the school is planning to use. You also have the right to know exactly what your child is learning and when. Uh, the school will have to give you a detailed uh, account of what your children is learning or what your child is learning. The resources are going to be used, the lesson plans. If they're inviting in outside agencies, you also have the right to know who those agencies are as well. Uh, and the school also has to provide workshops and meetings for parents, so you can request a meeting for all parents to discuss uh, how the school is going to be rolling out RSE. So you do have the right to be consulted and informed at each process of the way the school is developing this new curriculum. However, in reality, uh, what I'm experiencing on the ground is that most parents aren't consulted, uh, so like I said, you're going to have to take the initiative uh, and ask for that yourself. Now the school does, uh, sorry, the, the government does mention that there are some religious rights, and that is that if a school, or when a school is teaching a sensitive issue, they have to consider the religious background of the children that it's teaching. So if they are teaching things such as same-sex relationships that go against the teachings of most major faiths, they have to do it in a way that does consider your religious background, um, not in a very overt, uh, kind of impository way. Um, they do have to consider your background. Again, on the ground, this isn't always the case happening, and obviously there's a lot going on in Birmingham and Parkfield at the moment, uh, but you do have the right of the government to have your religious background considered. The details of uh, the rights are all on the website as well in, in more detail, so I'll give you the details at the end, but you can download everything there as well. Um, so basically, kind of coming into the resist, how do we resist this? And it really is step one, if your child is in school, you're going to have to become very proactive in your child's school. It's no longer enough just to drop them off in the morning and pick them up in the afternoon. Um, first step I suggest is, is speaking to your head teacher uh, and just finding out exactly what your child is learning. Um, you can ask them, you know, if a lot of schools have already drawn up the curriculum for RSE, you can ask for a copy of that. Um, if you're not satisfied, you can ask for more detail, ask to see the lesson plans, have they chosen their resources and things like that. But that would be step one, is to speak to your head teacher to find out exactly what they're doing. Now many parents might be intimidated to do this, uh, and people have said it could be quite a scary process approaching the head about these, these subjects. So what you can do is, is as parents form a group, so there's four or five of you in a school, uh, form a group so you can support each other. And then you can go as a group to the head teacher. This is also good if you do have concerns, because a single voice uh, is going to have less of an impact than a group. If there's a group of you um, airing a concern, the school are going to be far more likely to listen to you. However, we have to start in a, a more friendly, proactive approach. Um, so I would say, where possible, try and get involved in the school community, um, join the Parent Teachers Association, become a parent governor even. If we can engage with the school in a proactive way, um, you would then be seen as, as a part of that school community. And it's far more likely that the head is then going to listen to your concerns because they will want to work with you. They won't just see you as kind of a problem coming towards them. <coughs> However, again, the reality on the ground is many schools have been, from what the kind of anecdotal evidence I'm hearing, is that many schools are assisting parents' concerns. Um, and if that is the case, then you will need to kind of perhaps be a bit more assertive in your approach. But regardless, try and get involved in the school with the policy development um, in choosing the resources. If you're not happy with the resources that they're choosing, either suggest alternatives or even produce some yourself. I am trying to compile a list of more suitable uh, resources that can be used for uh, RMC. Just to give one example, the teaching of uh, the private parts and safeguarding children. Like I said, there's been some very inappropriate material out there. However, the NSPCC uh, do do something called the PANTS programme, and whilst I don't 100% agree with their approach, it is at least modest. They don't use uh, graphic terminology and they don't use graphic images, so there is a, a decor of their modesty there. So that, you know, if you are going to have to teach children about these subjects, is definitely a, a better alternative to uh, getting children singing the names of their private parts or making them out of Play-Doh. Um, so it's very important that you don't just say we don't want that, say we don't want that, but actually can we try this as well, this resource is more suitable. If you are having no luck and you're meeting a lot of resistance, your next step uh, would be to try and speak to the Chair of Governors. Uh, the Governors have a lot of power, and actually the Governors will need to sign off any curriculum and any resources that are being used, and that's why I'm urging parents to actually try and become parent Governors as well. Um, but like I said, if you're not having much luck with the head teacher, try and speak to the head, uh, the chair of governors, 
and ensure that your concerns are taken seriously. Um, that, that's very important. Again, if you're still having no luck, it, it's probably a question of speaking to the local authority or to even your local MP. I'm not saying you're even going to get much luck there, but don't don't give up and don't be fobbed off because this is again a lot of parents are telling me the school are just trying to fob them off and not take their concerns uh, seriously. You know, even the government have said the resources that a school you use have to be age appropriate. So if you generally have concerns that they're not age appropriate, you will need to make a, a formal complaint as well. Hopefully over the couple of weeks and months ahead we will try and get some more detailed support for parents and how to have these conversations with schools because uh, we do acknowledge it it's a very, can be quite an intimidating process for some parents. One thing is please stay vigilant. Um, like I said, the UN regardless want this comprehensive sexuality education in all schools within the next 10 years. So what is happening, you may be placated now, you, you might be reassured by your school, but please just stay aware and stay vigilant. <coughs> stay monitoring all the resources coming in and the critical eye. Okay, so there are a few um, options for education. Uh, the majority of our children, I think, probably are in state schools, uh, so that's why I focus kind of on the concerns mm -hmm. predominantly in those areas. However, when, if you're in a situation where you are selecting a school or changing a school, it's going to be very, very important to consider the ethos of the head teacher, because um, they, again, do have a lot of influence in how RSE will be taught. So one of the schools, for example, I work in is a church school, and the head is a very practicing Christian. It's a primary school, and she has said she is not, no way is having sex education in her school. She's also refusing to send teachers on training for the likes of Stonewall. And she's trying to minimise um, the, sort of the, the different LGBT agenda as well. So it's very important that you check off the ethos of uh, the school as well. Equally, I've had parents come to me who's gone to the head teacher and only discover that the head teacher is also part of Stonewall. So he's obviously got his own agenda. So the agenda or the kind of the ethos of the head teacher is going to be very, very important uh, in determining how RSE is rolled out in the schools. Now with faith schools, there is currently uh, some flexibility in that faith schools are allowed to teach their faith perspective on sensitive issues. So that does mean that uh, a faith school, whether it's Christian or Jewish or uh, Islamic, can teach their views, their faith views on homosexuality. However, there is no option not to teach it. They still will have to teach it. And they have to teach that there's um, a balanced debate about it and they have to adhere to the Equality Act. So that's kind of that in itself. However, taking into consideration a lot of the faith schools are private schools, they've also got the additional issue of Ofsted, who are now trying to push something through that is actually saying that uh, private schools have to not only teach LGBT issues, actually promote them. So just to be aware of that. Um, I am in touch with AMS, which is the Association of Muslim Schools, and they have basically come up with an RSC curriculum that can be used in Muslim schools. Um, that has been approved by the Department of Education. They haven't actually developed it yet, but the concept and the criteria that it's going to include has been approved uh, by the Secretary of State. They are hoping to have something ready by September 2019. Um, so that gives at least the Muslim schools some hope. Um, and I've asked them how they, they got around the LGBT issue. And they said they've basically just said what the UK law says, um, but they've also expanded the whole kind of area of relationships, focusing on relationships with grandparents, with community. So it becomes a much broader subject. It's basically going to be uh, rolled out in 12 less discrete lessons that schools can then use and implement as they wish. And the good thing is they are very open to people adapting uh, the curriculum for their own uses, whether it's their own schools of thought or different kind of circumstances. But if people do want to find out more about that, please Google the Association of Muslim Schools. Uh, there is a contact email there, and you can get in touch with them. They're also open to schools trialling uh, this new curriculum as well. Faith schools, you know, where we're looking at Catholic. So I know a lot of families are taking their children out of state schools and putting them into more Catholic or, or church schools, purely because there's still a, a moral ethos there. So when they are teaching uh, the likes of contraception or whatever, you would hope at least they still will teach traditional marriage as the ideal. Um, so faith schools, again, check out the ethos of the head teacher, um, but I would say that those are going to be a practical alternative um, to, to state schools. 
Home education, so Sister mentioned uh, the importance of home education earlier. Um, so home education is legal in this country at the moment. Like I said, there is a consultation currently going through that's trying to tighten up the regulations. However, with home ed, you don't have to teach national curriculum, you don't have to teach RSE, you can devise, uh, you basically just have to demonstrate that you're educating your child. And you can actually currently interpret that however, in, in any way you want. Um, it can be a incredibly rewarding uh, process for parent and child, but it does take a lot of work and a lot of commitment. Um, and it's going to be very suitable for some families, but it's not going to be suitable for all families. So I think we've got to kind of respect the individual difference within that. Um, the process is currently quite straightforward. If your child has never been to school, actually you don't need to do anything. You don't have to tell anybody because they're not on the educational register. As far as I'm aware, you can just actually keep them at, keep them at home. Um, I would also urge parents with younger children to keep them off school for the first seven years of their life because that is the formative period when a, ch a child forms those core beliefs and attitudes and values. So at least if you can prevent your child going into the school environment for those first seven years, you've done them a massive service. If you're taking children out of school, you do have to deregister them. Um, and I would just, as, as a quick kind of search on Google, uh, there's Education Otherwise, which is a national organisation that supports people home educating. Um, there's various, I think, home education websites and support groups in our community as well. Um, I'm happy to give people the names afterwards. Uh, but there is, there is actually a lot on the internet on the actual process of uh, deregistering your child. Like I said, you don't have to teach a national curriculum, you can do it any which way that you want. And when I, I home educated my children, I actually just wove it into everyday life. So I took them shopping and we did maths as we were kind of buying food in the supermarket. Um, they read papers on the tube and things like that. So you can be very creative uh, in the way that you want to do it. However, it is a big commitment, um, but I guess it's all about kind of prioritizing what is important for our children. And I do say for those families that are homeschooling or considering it, we do as a community need to support them as well. It can be quite a lonely process if you're doing it on your own, but actually currently as the law stands, you can come together with other families um, and you can come together for under 18 hours and it still counts as home education. So if you had four or five families forming like a, a home ed group, you can actually teach your children together so you've got the support of others with you. The main point is just do not exceed 18 hours, because if you do, you then have to register it as a preschool. Um, so that is definitely, you know, for the Derby community, if there's several families that are interested, I would suggest coming together and kind of thinking about how you can do that. I'd also say the skills within the community need to be used, so if you've got maths teachers or English teachers, can people then actually volunteer to tutor a group of children in maths or English as well? So we have to think about these things and how to support each other. But like I said, there's actually a lot of information on the internet about how to uh, homeschool in this country. And I can give people details at the end as well. One of the things that I mentioned is, is a production or trying to think about a counter-curriculum. Um, the madrasa is obviously quite a core kind of feature of, of many communities. A lot of our children do go to the madrasa. Um, there is no responsibility on the madrasa to have to teach children RSE at all. And I think it's, it's a very... A lot of parents suddenly kind of taking the madrasa sort it out, and it's actually not the madrasa's responsibility to sort this stuff out. However, um, I think it can potentially play a very important role if we can somehow develop an, R an Islamic RSE counter curriculum. By that, what I mean is we take all the subjects that our children are going to be learning in schools and we put it into an Islamic context. Not only that, we also give our children critical thinking skills, perhaps psychological insights uh, and techniques that is going to help them then develop kind of an identity and a personality and a, a knowledge base where they can then combat this stuff that is not only in schools, um, but that is in the wider society. They're going to be in a much, much stronger position. Um, and this is what I mean by immunising our children against this, because we, we're not going to be able to shelter them away from it, um, whether we homeschool them, state school them or whatever. I think within that we also need parallel workshops for parents, so the parents know exactly what their child is learning in these lessons and then they can reinforce this at home. But this is a massive undertaking, it's going to need a lot of work. Um, but it's also something you as individuals or as a community can start developing for yourselves as well. Inshallah. Okay, the main point in all of this is 
parents have got to take responsibility for their own child. This is probably the, the most important thing. On the day of judgment, it's you as a parent that's going to be questioned, not the madrasa, not, not the scholar, not the mosque. It's you as a parent that is ultimately responsible for the education of your children. Um, we're very quick to demand our rights to be the primary educator, but actually how many of us do actually want to take that on board and, and have these conversations uh, and talk to our children about these things? Um, like I said, it, the primary responsibility lies with us, the parents. One thing you can all do is to prioritise quality time with your children. And I know it's incredibly busy, uh, we all have to work and juggle a multitude of things. But we need to prioritise prioritize quality time with our children. And actually learn to listen to our children. So it's not just telling them to do this, don't do that. Learn actually how to listen. Um, this is so, so important because when we can listen to our children in a non-judgmental way, our children are more likely to open up to us, tell us about their concerns. Um, we then become that trusted person that they come to when they are worried. If they are learning something at school that doesn't feel right to them, that they can then feel safe enough to actually tell us what has happened. You know, and spending that quality time, it could be like, depending on the age of the child, it could be half an hour before bed, just sitting with them, so just getting them to talk about what's on their mind. Um, going for a walk with them at, at the weekend. Often when you're side by side, it's much easier to communicate rather than face to face. And it's been shown actually the activity of moving and walking actually frees up something in people that they open up and share and connect much more easily. So it's, again, it doesn't just have to be about RSE topics, it can be anything. Just, just listen to your child's concerns, what are their interests, just strengthen that bond with your child. This is really going to be the most important uh, thing that we can do to save our children. We're also, as parents, going to have to take responsibility for our, Islamic, our children's Islamic education. Um, it's, it's no longer enough to just send them off to the madrasa at the weekend and think our job and our duty is done. It begins and it ends at home. Um, yesterday, when I was in Nottingham, the, the Sheikh Hassan said, you know, you've got a Quran in the morning, Quran in the evening. So before your child goes to school, whether it's a recitation of Quran or you're just instilling in them their Islamic values, start the day with that and end the day with that. So that way their whole personality will be imbued with the Islamic teachings and values. And those are the seeds that we need to plant. Um, it begins and ends at home, nowhere else. <coughs> when we kind of think about RSC in particular, you're, you know, we are going to have to educate ourselves about, as parents about all these different issues. Um, and we're going to have to answer our children's questions. I acknowledge it is a really embarrassing subject um, to have to talk to our children about these, but we're going to have to find ways to actually overcome this, this uh, embarrassment to have these conversations with our children. Um, but it can start young. It can start as young as just, you know, Lara in the Quran says we guard our private parts. You don't necessarily need to go into any more detail. So you have these conversations in a, almost a drip, drip by drip fashion. It's not sitting them down having the big talk. You'll just slowly educate them Islamically, building that relationship with them. So it's actually a much more easier process. One of the questions is when do we talk to our children about these things? And I think there's kind of there's two things to consider. One is uh, the age of the children, but the problem is if we know our children are going to learn a certain subject next week on a Wednesday afternoon, we don't have to talk to them about it first, even if it's a Sunday night before, to at least put it in some sort of context for them from an Islamic perspective and take some of the potential shock or distress away from them. We can't avoid that, otherwise the teacher is going to get there first and that is actually going to cause more damage. Um, however, if the school isn't teaching certain subjects, then you know it is actually maybe waiting for those kind of spontaneous moments uh, that arise, again, depending on the age of the child. So if you're in the high street and you see two men kissing and your child says, why is that man kissing that man? You actually have that conversation in the moment there with your child. Um, this is a really difficult job for parents and I don't think any of us have all the, the right answers or solutions. Um, but we do need, again, to think how can we support parents in having these conversations. Um, there's going to be a real need to develop resources for workshops so actually parents feel empowered uh, to have these conversations with their children. And ultimately, this is what the government should be doing, rather than make it mandatory in schools. Uh, but you know, this is kind of on, on. This is the real kind of work that needs to be done. Not only the counter curriculum, uh, but also how do we support parents in having these conversations with their children? And if there are certain issues, actually, that is going to be very uncomfortable uh, for parents to have the conversation with, but also the young people, then we need to find workshops. 
you know, parents feel uncomfortable about talking to their teenagers about pornography, then, okay, we need as a community to develop workshops where we get an expert in to have these conversations um, with our children because it's a more comfortable kind of space set for the young people as well as the parents. So these are all just ideas for us to kind of go away and think about um, and what we can do. And this is how we can prepare, prepare and protect our children. Um, this stuff is coming regardless. We can resist it as far as we can. But the long-term strategy has to be to protect, to prepare our children uh, in, this, in these ways. What I would urge you as a community here in Derby to do is to try and form a local group, uh, whether it's a group of parents or a community group. Um, try and think how you as a community can tackle this issue. Um, try and think what strategies that you can do, whether it's forming workshops for parents and youth initiatives. Whatever it is, think about your skill set as well. Um, you know, large communities, there be various skill sets, whether it's IT, story writing, maths tutoring. Think about what skill set that you can bring and offer, and perhaps, you know, support your local community and families uh, in this regard. So I'd really like to say, urge parents to, and the community to kind of, to take ownership of this. Um, like I said, there is uh, this kind of thing that some big organisations, some like the grassroots movement, and parents and communities have got to kind of take action and responsibility themselves, um, because this kind of safety from the sky really isn't going to happen, I don't think. We also know that God helps those who help themselves. Um, and I always use the analogy of uh, the Battle of Bada as well. You know, there's a small group of believers and the enemy was massive, um, but they, they stood up and they stood firm and Allah did bring the help. Um, so I think as long as we do our bit and we tie our camel and trust in God, the, the help will come. God's not going to forsake us in this. We just have to do our bit, inshallah. Okay, so that's just a summary. Uh, like I said, people can have a copy of the slides if they email me. Um, the basic things you can do is so contact your local MP, um, you can sign the petition, uh, engage and resist in your schools, really just find out what your child is learning, learning in schools. Um, you can become a governor. Uh, somebody also suggested yesterday become teachers. Actually, there's going to be a real need and demand for Muslim teachers. So uh, anybody who's kind of interested in that, uh, go down that route set up a local community. Uh, we have also set up a Stop RSC forum um, to try and continue these discussions. So it's, it's like an online platform where people can get advice, they can share experiences, ask questions and things. Um, it's a link to it on the website as well. Um, educate our children in RSE from the Islamic perspective. Um, develop community and youth initiatives. Again, we've got to strengthen our youth's Islamic identity. This is really, really crucial. Um, support those families that are home educating and develop perhaps those community <coughs> home educating groups that can come together. Develop an Islamic uh, RSE counter curriculum that can be used either at home or in the madrasa. And support the Islamic schools that we already have and build more. We need to prioritise our resources and our funds because um, at least currently, although it's not great, they still are a lot better alternative to the state schools. And inshallah, if we do this, plus any other great ideas people have, we can create children that have a strong Islamic identity, who are then able to critically understand, resist, and defend themselves against the onslaught, uh, inshallah. So just some final points. Um, our children are a trust from God, and it's the right and responsibility of parents and families to protect and educate them in these intimate matters. It is not the right of the state that the children do not belong to the state. We need to fight for our parental rights and preserve the traditional family. We need to protect our children's innocence. We need to stop these secular, liberal, sexual ideologies seeping into our schools. And therefore, we also need to stop RSE, because that is the gateway that these secular ideologies are coming through. So the website um, that there is quite a lot of information on, as well as you know, me to contact uh, us as well, is uh, stoprse.com. Um, the forum you can access directly through that website. Also, you can also go uh, via stoprse.net. Uh, the email address is info at stoprse.com. I also have a, a WhatsApp update group. It's admin only, but I just post updates about what's happening, relevant articles and things. If you would like to be added to that, please just drop me an email and then I can send you the link. Um, so that is the end of the, the talk, the presentation. So I do hope uh, that whilst it is pretty grim out there, 
that there is a sense that there are some things that you can do, uh, inshallah. Uh, but I'm very happy now just to take questions for the remainder of the time. <clears throat> Highlight LGBT education and how much it is taught in RSC at the moment in primary and secondary school. Explain what LGBT means. That's a good point. So LGBT means lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual. Uh, so it's all the different sexual kind of identities. Um, highlight. It's going to, the problem, how it's taught in primary and secondary is going to massively vary between schools, so I can't give a standard answer to that. I mean, I work in a couple of schools, it's hardly actually taught in those schools at all. But then I've got other schools that parents are telling me that it's, like I said, you've got the No Outsiders programme where it's actually already being uh, taught throughout the whole curriculum. All I would say is, as a parent, you need to approach your school and find out how it's currently being taught in your school and also how it's going to be taught uh, once RSC becomes compulsory. Another question was LGBT, so apologies for not clarifying uh, what that was. But yes, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual. There's sometimes a Q on the end, which also stands for queer. Uh, what is your opinion on what age it is appropriate to teach on Muslim children about LGBT? Um, I don't know, I, I, if that's an Islamic question, you probably need a scholar to answer that for you. Um, I, at basic primary school, I don't think it's appropriate at, at all, you know, not even heterosexual relationships. I don't think teaching primary school children about any form of sexual uh, identity is appropriate, because it's actually just going to confuse them. Um, and like I say, puberty is a natural age of awakening in children. I think primary school should not be exposed to any of this stuff, my personal opinion. Are there any questions? <coughs> you mentioned that the situation of Muslim schools are preparing like alternative to RSE. And also, uh, you mentioned that they cover the LGBT. Uh, so I, I don't imagine how it covers LGBT and it would be an Islamic alternative. So basically, it's not, they're not saying this is an Islamic counter curriculum. What they've tried to do is, because all schools are going to have to teach it, the government have made it law, they've tried to minimise the damage. Um, they've basically taken the minimum guidelines and tried to use that to best effect. Uh, by only teaching what the UK law says. The problem is there is no option not to teach it. Uh, that is the law. The Jewish schools are refusing to teach it, um, and I know they keep being failed by Ofsted. But it, it's basically, you don't have to, the AMS have done this curriculum, you don't have to use it, they've done it. They said this will get you ticked off by government for teaching RSE. We've tried to do it the best, or the least harmful way possible. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, obviously a conflict of, of you know, beliefs that are going on, but this is now being imposed on us uh, by, by the government, so they've got no option not to teach it. All they can do is say, this is what the UK law says, this is what Islam says. You know, that's, that's the best you can do. Um, and hope within that, that you can at least give the children a good understanding of what our religion says and why we say it. Um, if they would say that this is what the UK law says and what the Islam says, it's okay, but if they say that this is an Islamic. <laughs> no, they're not saying this is Islamic. These, they, I think I, I haven't actually seen, I've spoken to them, and this is they, how they said they, they tackled it. Um, they're not saying this is our Islamic version. They're having to meet the government guidelines, which are now law coming to, to be a law in the country. They have to teach LGBT, so they do say in this country, two men can get married. However, in Islam, we can't get married. You know, it has to be marriage between a man and a woman. That, that's the kind of the best you can do, really, for the minimum. So, but if you want to know more, you can Google uh, AMS uh, and to contact the you know, uh, to find out more. Also, where the resources will be ready, inshallah. Hi, I just wanted to say that Jabba Moore's hair brush here, uh, in the summer, Trump organised an anti bullying day, but the actual underlying theme was LGBT issues. Um, and then at the end of the day, in the assembly, he cried out and openly stated he was gay, and that that was not going to be that there was going to be a lot more of this um, open day rather than to have just pushing the fact that you can be in Now, should that concern parents? And how do you find out what exactly that school is going to do on their 
when classes drop down there, so they don't have regular classes, they have a team that runs mm -hmm. through activities for their school. So yeah. I'm not a parent of a child in that school, but I think that people need to be aware that that's going on, because some children have gone home and told the parents about that. So. Mm. No, it's true, and the sister was saying actually it's it's not a specific lesson. I mean, uh, we've also got LGBT month now, uh, so a lot of schools are they're weaving this stuff. I think, yeah, and the reality is I'm, I'm trying to give you a very kind of middle ground view, um, but the reality in, in a lot of schools, the whole LGBT gender is, is being heavily promoted. There's, there's no, no doubt about that. They're going above and beyond uh, really what they should be should be doing, uh, but they're allowed, to, they're, they're allowed to by government. Um, that's it's LGBT month. We're seeing the rainbow flags everywhere. Um, I was in my son's school, and they all wear LGBT badges, um, they've all got LGBT homework. We know schools have gay pride marches back in the sun term, so a lot of the state schools are, are really going for this. Um, so yeah, it's, but you're just going to have to find out, and it's not only what's happening in IC, as the sister said, it's also, you know, themed assemblies, uh, the wall displays, um, special kind of days where they're devoting to these different things, um, they're getting stonewall in to do different trainings, anti-bullying. Um, you're really just going to have, as a parent, going to have to be really on it, uh, which, particularly at secondary school, I acknowledge it's really hard. Um, you don't really know what's going on. And I said, just keep having those conversations with your children um, and find out from them as well what is happening, so at least you can give that, that kind of counter-argument to them. I just want to add to the point about that, uh, about Darby School, because uh, we also have a, uh, um, a local WhatsApp group, um, and so we're posting information on that. And just to add to that point, that um, some of the parents have said to, to uh, which I posted, is that um, their child has been excluded from school because they um, jokingly referred to somebody as gay. Um, a child has had detention in that school, um, made to write why it's um, not right to call some, you know, not to abuse, you know, sort of bully or use that sort of language, um, anti. Um, what, homophobic language. Um, a child has also um, been disciplined and excluded um, <coughs> from Derby Moore School. Um, and uh, another parent said that the head is going to get married and apparently there is going to be a big sort of a celebration of that, however, in which shape or form. So it's just to add to what Sister's saying about what is happening actually at one of the local schools. So um, it, just to add the local perspective here. Yeah. Alongside this is a, an anti zombie agenda, which is obviously anyway. So, how would you frame this in a way that you're not going down the, the route of so called homophobic yeah. or, you know, you've got to be clever about the way that you do it? So yeah, so the, the question was how do we kind of discuss these issues without being slapped with the label of being homophobic? So, I mean, to be homophobic, you have to actually be discriminatory or talk about hate speech. Uh, to say what your faith believes, you know, like I said, we're also uh, covered in the Equality Act, so we, we have the right to say what we believe, so it's absolutely fine to say, this is what I believe. Um, and a sister yesterday in Nottingham gave a very good example of when she approached the head, and she said, look, you uh, may not agree with a lot of things I do, but I'm not calling you Islamophobic. And in the same way, I, I disagree with some of the things that you know, the LGBT community do, but I'm not homophobic. And she said, actually, by naming that up front, it actually put her in a very strong position. So I say, actually, I'm not homophobic in the same way that I know you're not Islamophobic, but we just fundamentally have disagreements about certain issues. Um, so you, know, you're, you are within your right to say what your faith teaches. Um, what is homophobic is when you're discriminatory or you're actually being you know, nasty or mean about somebody on the basis of their, their sexual identity. And I don't think anybody would, would condone that. So, uh, but we need to be empowered actually we're allowed to say what we do because um, we're also a protected characteristic. Um, but you're right, it's about getting the language right. Um, there probably needs to be more guidelines, I think, or guidance for parents on how to have these conversations.
um, and kind of organising in education over the last six years, you know, going up and down, like going into schools, it, it's always the um, non-BME community who are the most vocal. And actually, yes, we know that discrimination takes place, but I can't encourage enough for us as Muslims to come forward because and not use your trade unions as an insurance policy because if they are promoting an LGBT agenda and they are supporting these curriculums, that's not going to change unless we get forward into those branches, into those districts, and put a motion forward and start talking and debating about these things. So that's the first thing that, you know, it's not the powers that be at the top of the union, it's the members of the union who are dictating that. So actually as staff, you do not have any powers in terms of the strategy of what's um, discussed and what gets put forward. So please, please, you know, put your motion forward and start discussing this. Um, the second thing is about, obviously you mentioned about lobbying your MP, which absolutely is really useful. But in Derby, we've also got um, love, um, local council elections coming up in May. Um, so every political party is going to be out there trying to get your votes, and now is the time. We've seen what's happened to the councillor in Birmingham. However, now is the time, as you said, to word that correctly and start having those conversations with our councillors. But please, please, with everything we can do, can we do this in writing? Whether you're emailing your head teacher, whether you're emailing, um, contacting your chair of governors, we need a re written record of this so actually people aren't coming back to us and saying these conversations didn't take place. I was speaking to a parent earlier on and she said, you know, can we draft a letter together? Yeah, let's create a letter. I'm quite happy to draft that letter and send it out to people so that actually we've got one that we can use for Derby. And just on the point of contacting schools, where schools are part of multi academy trusts, which we know due to the privatisation agenda, a lot of schools are academies now. Rather than just contacting your one school, let's think do things strategically and let's contact, you know, the chief executive of the academy chain and, and kind of say that this needs to be consistent with all the schools in that trust. Thank you. Are you on the Derby WhatsApp group? Yes. Great. I've got a great advocate there. So thank you for your brilliant ideas. Um, any other questions? Can I just add to that? In terms of local councillors, um, we have contacted every single councillor, not once, um, at least three times. I have my staff here who could be a witness to that. Email them individually, um, uh, inviting them, and when we change the venue, again inform them. I don't know whether there is a councillor here, I'm not familiar, but um, we have contacted the councillors, we've contacted every single head. Um, initially, the, the, this event was going to be held at Zaytuna, which is um, you know, a, a faith-based uh, free school. And so, of course, you know, what, what, I, I, beyond saying that we have contacted everybody, um, that's, it's up to the individuals to attend, to be here to support us, um, including every single head that we have contacted um, across, the, across the Star Beach, inviting them to today's event. So I don't know whether there is a head here, here from any of the schools or whether any councils are here. So it speaks for itself, sister. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just going to ask you. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you for all the fantastic work that you're doing. But I just wanted to ask some of the umbrella Muslim groups within the country, have they approached you to work with you on this front? I, I have been approached by some of the larger uh, Islamic or Muslim organisations. Um, but basically what I'm saying is, me personally, I'm happy to work with parents and communities. So I, I think this needs to be a grassroots community, uh, movement. The moment you get organisations involved, it becomes very political, and actually they have quite often different agendas uh, for reasons for contacting me. Um, I said I won't partner with them, however I will give them information, um, so a couple have approached me about writing a cookbook that they be delivered, so I'm going to give them that information. Um, like I said, that, that is just the stance that I'm, I'm taking, is to work with parents and, and communities and make it a grassroots movement, rather than getting the big organisations involved. They're very free to come up with their own strategies and solutions, but personally I, I don't get involved with that. My children are in school, but if they were, and I was going to try and form a group to go to the head, I would try to, um, I would try and make that group as diverse as possible. I wouldn't go just as a group of Muslim parents, I would seek out, as I said, there's decent people out there going to be absolutely, you know, horrified by the stuff, and I think with a much, much stronger voice, you're prepared to work with anybody and you act it and you try